sustainability excellence, innovating education in hospitality and tourism for the next decade, and comes to you both in honor of World Tourism Day being today, and with the kind compliments of the Tobago Hospitality and Tourism Institute on the heels of their 27th anniversary. So of course we can understand that that's double 27 today. It is an honor to be your host for this evening's discussion, and I invite you to grab this opportunity to engage with the intellectuals, practitioners, and tourism champions on our panel. You are especially encouraged to collect your questions and to spin all these questions to our esteemed panel without fear or fever. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your night. It's your night to press for answers. It's your night to contemplate your next educational venture. And it's your night to evaluate hospitality and tourism as a lucrative and rewarding career. Officially, my name is Mr. Kennedy Pemberton, and it is an absolute pleasure to be your host. By way of an introduction, I hail from the beautiful Twill Island Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, and I am the founder and lead tourism strategist at Simple City Solutions, a boutique consultancy specializing in sustainable tourism for small island developing states. I consider myself a global student of hospitality and tourism, and one who is easily excitable about the practical applications of a sustainable visitor economy and its unmistakable interconnectedness with a peaceful and prosperous Caribbean region. My role this evening is to ask the tough questions, to guide our discussion, and to channel your comments and concerns to our esteemed panel so that individually and collectively, we can help recalibrate hospitality and tourism education for the next decade. This evening, our panel includes the esteemed Mrs. Laura Dowich Phillips, who is the Public Relations Manager for Experience Turks and Caicos. Mr. David Edwards, who is the Dean of Gus Machado College of Business at St. Thomas University. And Ms. Alicia Edwards, who is a Project Management Professional and Experienced Tourism Champion. Welcome once again. Happy World Tourism Day and happy 27th anniversary to the Tobago Hospitality and Tourism Institute. Without any further ado, I now invite our esteemed panelists to formally make their introductions and to deliver opening remarks that contextualize their interpretation of tonight's theme. And so as a reminder, we are discussing the topic, sustainability excellence, innovating education in hospitality and tourism for the next decade. Who will open the bowling? Panelists? Alicia, I see you smiling. Go right ahead. So good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to begin by saying congratulations to the Tobago Hospitality and Tourism Institute. I have had a long and convoluted history with um, the Institute, and it's good to see the organization continue from strength to strength, serving what is really a vital need on the island of Tobago. But when we talk about education and specifically um, tourism education, I want us to think beyond some of the, what we think as tourism specific things. So we think about hospitality management, tourism management, culinary management, tour guiding and operations. But I want to start just by saying that almost every single study discipline that might be around is applicable to tourism, especially in this new dispensation. So if you think about people who are qualifying and requalifying themselves in AI, in IT, in graphics and all of that, there are opportunities for them in tourism, not just on the marketing and promotion side, but also in terms of living museums. When you go to some countries now, when you go to Dubai and some other places, they actually have living museums. And all of these things are done by people who are into AI and animation and so on. 
when you look at translation services, people may think, well, I'm an English major, right? I studied literature, I studied French, I studied Chinese, but there is a huge need for translation services, not just tourist to tourist, but also business to business, et cetera, based on how the global flow goes. Let's say you studied sports administration or sports management. There are opportunities for you in terms of active um, things like water sports and all of that, administrating those, managing, being involved in consultancies and so on. And let's say you studied something like biology or geography. There are opportunities there, not just for diving, uh, but also content creation, education, and all of that. So the point I want to make um, specifically is that education is a good thing. Tourism education is necessary to thrive, but there, there are opportunities outside of the strict tourism streams then that are very invaluable for growing this industry in the Caribbean. And I think that what has happened for a long time is that we have been very myopic about what is required to be in the industry. Um, people who are in HR and hiring are a bit myopic about what you need to, to excel or to do well in a particular field in tourism. And I think that the time has come for us to see how interdisciplinary, how interrelated, how interconnected all of these things are, boring things like architecture, accounting, health and safety, project management, finance, all of those things are interconnected in this tourism conversation. And so while curriculums will not evolve that way specifically, there are, I think there are opportunities for educational institutions offering tourism courses to find a way to expose students or to, to find some kind of integrated way to bring all of those things to bear on what has become a very dynamic and all-encompassing world business. I don't know if I took up too much time, but that's my opinion. Sorry, yes, I said, uh, I, I am smiling. I have a, at least four questions already just from that first ball that has been bowled. Uh, let me now invite David. David, join the conversation with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And as I get in, I want to add my um, own congratulations on behalf of St. Thomas University to um, the Tobago Hospitality and Tourism Institute on the occasion of their 27th anniversary. And um, it's a significant milestone, um, two decades approaching three decades and counting and the work that they have done over the years in educating professionals for the industry. So really want to add my word of congratulations and happy Royal Tourism Day to everyone here. Um, you can see from the number of attendees that we're all passionate about this um, industry and rightly so because tourism touches a lot more than most people recognize it contributes um in excess of 10 percent of global gross domestic product and while i'm not gonna bore anyone with statistics but i want to start that out in terms of setting the context of the importance of tourism as as um a means for survival and then when we talk about if we look just look just that alone from the global standpoint but when we talk about small island developing states like Tobago, that is multiples in excess of that 10% mark where uh, tourism is contributing to the GDP of, of um, the economy of SIDS. So the importance uh, then now being established is the role of education, because obviously education is going to play a significant role in any economy and the, the, the success of any economy education is pivotal to that so tourism education we talk about that and we mentioned the word now innovating and that is very timely as well because we would now consider ourselves in the post-covid era and when we look at where we were in 2019 2019 was a very um, pivotal year or benchmark um, year for the for, for the global tourism industry and already now in 24, we're not in all sectors and categories back there yet, but we're approaching their 2019 numbers coming off of this COVID era. So the projection is for 
more growth, which means that education is again going to come to the fore. Not only is it now growth, going back to Alicia's opening comments about the traditional sectors, but now we're seeing that what COVID did, and I don't want to delve too much into that in the opening remarks, but just to set the stage of what happened in COVID and, the, and how COVID pretty much forced um, different transformations in terms of people had to pivot to doing different things, doing things differently. Tourism was no um, different. And we are seeing now a new product that's um, um, emerging alongside that, as Alicia alluded to. So we'll speak a lot about that, I'm sure, in terms of what that innovation is going to require within education to satisfy this new context of, of tourism. So I'm happy to be here. I look forward to an enthralling discussion on this very important um, subject of um, tourism and actually innovating education in hospitality and tourism for the next decade. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for those comments. David, let me invite Laura to share a bit with us. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. From the beautiful Turks and Caicos Islands, you know, I have to do my little selling pitch. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to participate and congratulations on your 27th anniversary. So I'm just going to riff off of David. So he spoke about, he provided a global context. So I'll provide a regional context because I think it's important for us to know where we are as a region where tourism is concerned. And the Caribbean for the most part has, has more, many islands have already surpassed their 2019 figures. As a matter of fact, many islands have surpassed their 2023 figures. So Caribbean tourism has been doing really well. Um, the data analytics company Forward Key said for the first half of 2024, international arrivals in the Caribbean showed more than 10% year-on-year increase and overall growth of more than 13% compared to 2019. So we have been doing well as a region. And of course, we know more visitors translate into more spend. And, you know, it means more taxes for government because a lot of governments tend to tax, you know, their taxes in tourism. They tax the, the people who, when you buy a ticket, there's a tax attached to that, their airport taxes. But it also benefits citizens too, from taxis and tour services, hotel accommodation, restaurants. People make a livelihood off of tourism. And there are many islands, such as the one that I'm in, that is totally dependent on tourism, the Turks and Caicos Islands. We are about 80, 85% of the economy is based on tourism. There is nothing else here. So it is incumbent upon us to make sure that the tourism industry is robust and thriving. But as a region, we cannot rest in our laurels. Um, you know, studies are showing there's a, a little slowdown in the revenge travel that we saw post COVID. There are some sectors such as luxury tourism that are on the increase. But as a region, we face challenges that threaten our tourism sector, right? We have climate change, competition from other destinations, rising costs of airfare, accessibility, crime. And a critical factor to the sustainability and success of our tourism industry lies in our people. Therefore, education is very, very important. As Alicia said, it's not just the, the what, you know, many times people think of them, they think of people working in a hotel, but it goes so much way beyond that, as Alicia showed. And so we, we're looking at things like she spoke about AI. AI is going to change the industry. It is going to be incorporated more. It is going to change the industry. We have to know how we can use it to enhance the way we operate. What are the education pathways for people to manage AI, to, to understand the data? Data, data is king. More and more tourist boards are using data. We invest heavily in data. We are a DMO, a destination management organization, and we label ourselves as a smart DMO because we rely on data to determine what our strategies in marketing and PR will be. It is very important. Um, and, you know, many times we talk about tourism education, but I don't know if people think about the leadership part of it because every, we need leaders in tourism. Um, just earlier this month, I attended the State of Tourism Conference in the Cayman Islands, and I'm in the tourism director's meeting, and I'm looking around the room, and I'm like, well, look at all these new faces. There are so many new faces now at the leadership level. And I started to wonder, how are we preparing the next generation of leaders in tourism? What are we, what are, how are we training them? Do they have good project management skills? Do they have an understanding of product development? 
which is very vital to the visitor experience. Do they understand technology? Do they know how to analyze data? Do they have these leadership skills to handle a multi-generational workforce? Because the tourism industry, you have multiple generations of Gen Z who just don't want to be confined by anything. And they have Gen X who like to play by the rules for the most part, <laughs> right? So it, it, it's different approaches to the way we work. And all of those things are critical to the success of the tourism industry. Um, what about the soft skills? And, you know, more and more people talk about soft skills being important in this post-COVID world. Um, we see how people emerge from COVID just angry. When people spend their money and come to their destination, they want things to work. They want things to be best. And they are very, very demanding. Do we have the skills, the empathy, the customer service skills? The, are we creative? Can we easily pivot? Are we agile? All of how can education encourage some of those traits? Um, so yeah, so that is my, um, introduction. <laughs> wow. So much to choose from, uh, coming out of those opening statements. Where do I begin? Okay. Uh, um, if you would allow me, um, Kennedy, um, I think that, um, as, um, Laura was speaking and she talked about the next generation of leaders, um, in tourism. I think that it would be remiss of, of me and of us on this 27th anniversary of the Tobago campus, not to mention the giants on whose shoulders we are now standing. The person who really initiated the Tobago campus is now deceased. One, this is Agnes Webb. And some people in this room would remember her. She was a powerhouse, a woman who was at, I think, the University of Birmingham, and she came back to Tobago and she fought to bring tourism education to Tobago. Mr. Carlos Dillon, he's also now deceased. He was a member of that board. And he fought tirelessly, tirelessly, tirelessly to bring tourism education to Tobago. And I also want to mention Mr. Neil Wilson, former Secretary for Tourism, and um, someone who on the government side did all he could in terms of making resources, financial and other resources available for the Institute to, um, to be established and to continue to function. And so on this 27th anniversary, I just want to recognize and honor those contributions and um, let students know that a lot of work has gone into what is there now. And I hope that the current team and even those that are to come will appreciate the kinds of blood and sweat sacrifices that would have come um, many, many years ago for the Institute to be celebrating 27 years. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for that remembrance and those tributes, uh, Alicia. Uh, most important as we, we, we continue with the discussion this evening. Now, there's lots of food for thought that has emerged from those introductory statements. And I believe it was David, I think you were the first to make reference to COVID-19. And that time in our lives, that difficult period in Caribbean tourism that we have survived. So let, let's have a bit of a thematic discussion. As it relates to COVID-19, let's connect that to the discussion on education. So let's think about the post-COVID traveler. What type of implications are there for tourism education having come through and survived that COVID-19 era? Who wants to start the, the, the ball off with that? David? I'm sorry. If I can set a little bit of a framework, just piggybacking off something Laura said. Very importantly, um, she mentioned a key term, product development. So coming off of COVID-19, what we have seen is emerging sectors of the tourism industry. So we now, as educators or those on the education side, have to be aware of that because we're preparing people to, to understand that. And the, the mention was made of data science and stuff like that. That's become now key, where you have to be more effective in the way you deploy resources. So, so that's one of the things that the efficiency of what we're looking at. Interestingly, um, Laura or somebody mentioned um, that there's a little bit of a pullback from the, the, um, the, the, the revenge travel. And one of the things and I read an interesting article the other day that they were talking about is it's not necessarily that 
that that that that customers are looking um are not looking to spend but covid brought about a different mindset and customers are looking for a different experience so if you're not responding to that they're not going to pony up the money for that so and I think we have to uh, kind of set that context to understand as edu where education needs to go in, in addressing, uh, addressing that. Uh, thank you I, so much. I want to, yeah, I, yeah, want to support what they, I want to support what David is saying because in addition, a lot of things have changed since COVID. Um, from where I sit, I think that um, the product has had to become new um by force because of what covid did the clientele has changed significantly what may have been a typical customer profile or tourist profile for a lot of destinations that does not exist anymore and so with a new client or with a new client profile when your demographics change that requires a whole shift in how you find that demographic how you target that demographic how you attract that demographic and how you pull them into your sales funnel but more than that, the business model has changed as well. We have a lot more is, uh, asynchronous transactions happening. Um, yes, there is a need for that interface, but people are on their phones booking things at different times of the day. People want a different level of response. People are online on all these platforms comparing, so there needs to be a lot more transparency and value in what you offer in your product line. And so when you bring... Um, new product requirements, new clientele that are different demographic, probably the same people, but with a different mindset, new business models that are emerging, what you find is that education and all the other things now have to catch up. But the catch up is not automatic because remember, in order for your certification to be portable and recognized across borders, it has to be from an accredited organization. And when a program, when a, 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 an institution gets accreditation, they get accreditation at two levels. They get accreditation at the level of the organization itself to say, well, this university, this college is accredited to do X and Y. And then there is accreditation at the level of the program. Now, once you change a program significantly, David might help us with, with the percentage, but I know that once you change a program significantly, that program has to be re-accredited again. And that's a whole other um, that, that's a whole another thing. So there is necessarily this lag um, in, the, in the tourism education between what is required in the now and what organizations, accredited organizations in tourism can offer. And so there is that gap, there is that space that is there that somebody has to fill. And tourism um, trainers and tourism organizations like THTI and all the other colleges have to figure out a way of filling that gap. And the thing about it is that gap is not static because by next year, there are going to be a changes in the, in the business model again. What clients want might evolve again. And so the, the providers of tourism education and people who are in tourism education or thinking about joining or leading um, or thought leaders in tourism um, education, they now have to grapple with all of that in order not just to remain relevant, but to ensure that the people that come out of their trainings are capable of doing what they have to do. And I think that maybe this is a good time to talk to students um, who are on the call about not thinking about what you're studying now as terminal. There's something that I, I like to call qualification fatigue. People go through a difficult program, maybe a two-year or three-year program, and then they go, ah, I'm finished. But you cannot be finished, especially in this business, you know? So I hope that when you're through with this program that you're going to see it to the end for the THDI students and maybe other students in the region who are online, and that you're going to recognize how little you know and how much is changing even as you are, are, are completing this hurdle. And so there is the need at a personal level for a kind of responsibility to take your own knowing and retooling and your, 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 your education in your own hands. And so a whole lot of, 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 of things are in that mix. 
Okay, just two quick things before I ask Laura to, to sort of tag in with us. I know that we have persons who've started raising their hands already with questions. We're going to officially open for questions around the 6.50 mark. So definitely keep those questions uh, on the tip of your tongue. And you can even start putting those questions in the chat so that they can be funneled up to me. Right. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing before I ask Laura to tag in is that when it comes to tourism development, I usually see it as, as three major pillars in terms of the education. You're educating about product development, you're educating about market development, and you're educating, of course, skills development. So let me pose a hypothetical picking on one of those pillars. What do clients want and how do we reach them? How can we adapt education to reach them from that marketing standpoint, for instance, through social media? Back in my day, and I don't want to give away my age, there was such a thing as high five. And then high five was replaced by Facebook. And then Facebook was replaced by Instagram. And then Instagram has been pretty much knocked out by TikTok. Are we looking at these kinds of emerging, rapidly changing opportunities? Laura, what do you think? Yes, we are. Social media is a major vehicle for marketing a destination for reaching clients. Major. Um, it's, you know, a lot of people do their research. They go on, on, on Instagram. They go on Facebook. Um, you know, many destinations. There are so many Facebook groups that are spawned from destinations where people go and ask a million questions and they form a kind of community. So I see it all the time for Turks and Caicos. People are always asking, where's the best hotel? What's the best time I should come? What is the weather? So there are communities built on social media that help to drive that marketing. But there's also another part of it. There are also travel advisors. And one of the things we've seen after COVID is the increase in, in the, the revival of the travel advisor, travel agent. Um, a lot of people are using travel agents once again. Um, and they go to them for advice. They go to them to curate the, you know, the itinerary, to curate the experience for them. A lot of advisors have a lot of um, relationships with properties, with hotels, um, so they could talk to hotels and, and organize for clients. Because of course they will get a commission based on how many you know, they sell. Um, so that is a major thing. And, and you find that as a tourism board, a tourism entity, there's a lot of training that you have to do with travel advisors because many times they tend to be, because they're so crucial to the business, you have to train them, educate them about your destination, about what you're offering, what is the focus, what you're selling, what is the product, so that they are intimately aware and, you know, we have a lot of people coming, they come for farm trips to see for themselves. We go to them and do the training, go on road shows, because they are very, very vital right now in selling. And it depends on your niche too, right? Um, luxury tourism relies a lot on travel advisors because people, that market, they go to travel advisors. But you find that a lot of other people are doing that as well. People just don't want the hassle of sometimes just going on, on a, a website and booking their own flight. Sometimes they want the whole package. They want the flight, they want the, the, the hotel. They want you to tell them, okay, this is what I could do while I'm there. So that's uh, become a very crucial part. So the education part of it is, you know, um, Alicia spoke about being static, uh, not being static. And that's the beauty, I think, of the tourism industry. It is ever evolving. And it, so it requires the, 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 the schools, the institutions to really be agile themselves. Keep, uh, keep on what the trends are. Constantly look at what is happening in the tourism industry. So if it is that now, Travel advisors are the big thing. Maybe that is a direction you can go in where training is concerned. Courses that you can offer. Um, the data, we talk about the data, which is super, 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 super important because not, it doesn't just inform what you do as a tourism expert or entity, but it also informs your stakeholders, your hoteliers, your taxi drivers, even the supermarkets. They want to know. So, and so that also informs their strategies as well. Thank you so much, Laura. And, and I think you've hit the nail on the head there because that it, it starts to answer one of the immediate questions that came to mind. And perhaps this is a good opportunity for me to tag David into the conversation again in terms of how do we or how could we integrate uh, travel advisor negotiation, for instance, into tourism education? How do we integrate that, you know, that use of social media, that, that art of going viral? into tourism education. These real life tangible problems that make the industry a lot more practical to the person out there who might be thinking, hmm, what do I want to do with myself? What's an appropriate career path? So 
Thanks, thanks, Kennedy. And uh, let me go back to some of the opening discussions about one of the things that we are we have to do with the help of industry is to really educate students, not at our level, at the college level, starting from the primary level, okay. about the tourism industry, that this is a significant business. Right. So, for example, in my in my university, the, the, the tourism program is housed in the College of Business. So because sometimes the, there is a stigma attached. So we have to call a spade a spade. Right. Sometimes there's a stigma attached. So to speak to some of the things and when you have now this rapid change is that we now have to at the tertiary level produce students who are able once they get to industry to whether it's using the data to understand the changing, to do the forecasting, to look at the trend in the trends, to, we have to give them that acumen, that business acumen to be able to do that because we won't be able to catch up on everything in the academy. So application becomes also critical in the, in the academy. So we know that like, for example, in, in, in disciplines like culinary arts and so on, they get it, they go and they do their little internships, but Globally across the hospitality education, we have to ensure that we partner with industry to make sure that students are exposed. Because currently, a lot of what happens is the truth is that a lot of our students are not familiar with the product. So you have to get them integrated and, and, and using and interacting with the product before they get into industry. So the, whether that is through internships, work studies, however you, um, apprenticeships, however you want it. But we have to start this education about the hospitality and tourism business from early. So just like how you want to go into law, you want to go into medicine, you want to do architecture. Because one of the things, when I just got into the academy, I used to say that the only thing we don't have in tourism is space tourism right well guess what we have space tourism. <laughs> we have space tourism so we have a place for everybody so if we start record really making that education earlier to, to let people realize that the tourism industry provides viable careers and we need people in the c-suites we need people um in in upper management mid-management there's a pathway so I think that's really where 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 it starts, and 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 then once we set that culture with um you know the the, the policy makers and so on, that that will help a lot. Can I add to something, David? To David's point, please. Um, actually, more than just the tourism industry, I think the education from primary school needs to be more about your country, your destination. One of the things I had to do when I came to Turks and Caicos, so for those who don't know, I am from Trinidad. One of the things I had to do when I came to Turks and Caicos was a, was a training program called TIDES. It's an acronym for Together Individuals Delivering Excellent Service. And what TIDES does is teach you about the Turks and Caicos Islands, everything from the national flower, the national song, the national dish. And, the, in, and, and with that, you get an ambassador card and you, it, it's tied to business. So businesses need to do this to get a business certificate, right? But the whole aim of it is to ensure that every single body working in the tourism industry is on the same page, singing from the same hymn sheet about the Turks and Caicos Islands. It's about knowledge of destination because people today want information and they get really turned off if they ask you a question and you can't answer it especially when you're in a destination where there are multiple different cultures working in that destination with different accents people get turned off and they're like okay well you don't know about this destination what am i asking you're giving me wrong information so it is to ensure that people know and there are people here who say well i born here i know about here but didn't pass the exam because they really didn't know so it, to me, it, 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 David is right, it has to go back. That, that education has to go all the way to primary school. But er, tourism is everybody's business. Because even if you don't work in the tourism industry and you're going down the road and somebody asks you, stop you on Frederick Street and ask about Trinidad, you should be able to see what is the national flower? What is the anthem? What is the coat of arms? Why, why, wh when Pan was, you should know about the destination because you are selling the destination. 
If I could just add something to that, um, Kennedy. Okay, go ahead. That, go that, ahead. That, that is so critical because if you look now at the new traveler that's emerging, mm -hmm. where they're looking about experience, so to, to, to Laura's point, you have to be able to speak to that because that's what that's the value added. It's not just the room, it's not just the food. That's mm -hmm. the experience that they, they because if not, technically just sit and technology, you, you make a reservation, you do everything, but this is the value added that's gonna counter technology to to make destinations more attractive, really. You know, so when we have talk a little bit about will technology replace humans and stuff? No, it's gonna be here to help us work more efficiently. But this value added is what's gonna make destinations thrive in terms of room rates and so on. Right. Um, I, I just want to jump in here a little bit and add, add to the conversation about social media because what social media has done is that it has made each and every one of us with a device in our hand some sort of reporter and one of the things that destinations are struggling with is that they do not have as much control over the conversation they don't have full control over the conversation because they are what we call layers of of awareness so there's awareness about your your region your part of the world there's awareness about your destination the land and sea space um, within which you operate and then there is a layer of, of awareness about the experiences within the destination and sometimes when people are looking to decide what part of the world they come to, some of the conversations that we as locals post on social media don't really add value and create that positive uh, expression. And so beyond what we post specifically about tourism, I think it's it, the conversation about, and I think Laura has had a lot of conversations about how do you get your news media and all of your social media bacchanal pages or whatever you call them to craft their messages in such a way that when when people are looking or searching Trinidad and Tobago searching Turks and Caicos that what comes up is not a hundred percent negative how do you educate members of your population to know that when you go online and you say my country stinks my health service stinks my whatever stinks that that there are powerful AI mining software that are picking up all of those things, feeding those things into a system, and your destination is not getting the correct positioning in terms of share of positive voice and all of those things. So, but I think the challenge is that outside of the tourism space, a lot of people who make policy in our islands or politicians, a lot of people who sit in the public service, a lot of people in the private sector who manage resources and allocate resources um, for tourism, they don't really understand how all encompassing these things are. And so sometimes, and so the conversation cannot just happen among tourism professionals and within tourism education circles. I think the education has to start at the top because sometimes some of the things that our politicians say or prime ministers or presidents or whatever i mean it's like oops <laughs> and i don't think they're deliberately doing that but i think so i think there's so much work to be done and if we stretch what education is it's more than what we are teaching at places like thdi but it's really letting people appreciate how times have changed and how you always have to be on script if your destination is aiming towards a particular growth path and along a particular trajectory. And, and, and that is so, so, so important. So, you know, everything Alicia just said there, there are like three courses wrapped in that, right? There's understanding <laughs> SEO, which is very important as, a, as in PR and marketing, because whatever right. messages you're putting out there, you need to understand how to put, you know, you have your SEO, your, your keywords in it, so that when people search your stuff, your narrative, is what comes out on top. Um, there's aggressive public relations. <laughs> that is another course, good public relations. And also, okay, just went straight out of my head. Um, and good storytelling. Right. Um, it's important to be able to, to craft good stories for your social media, for your marketing. And these are the things that kind of help to, to combat, oh, crisis management. That's the other thing I was gonna talk about. Crisis communication, that's mm -hmm. a very important thing as well to understand, to combat all those things Alicia spoke about, which is, which is very, very real. You know how embarrassing it is to sit in Turks and Caicos and have people from here coming to me, showing me videos of things happening in Trinidad? 
it is embarrassing, you know, because it creates a certain perception of my country that I, I can't I can't lie and say, well, that will happen it right here in video. Like, why are we taking videos of people getting murdered? I don't understand, but that's a whole other thing. But yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, but no, no, I'm really enjoying the conversation. And I think just before we start taking live questions from the audience, we've been talking a little bit about, you know, how does education need to adapt to the post-COVID traveler? We've also straight into discussing education for survival, you know, those practical approaches to hospitality and tourism education. Let's talk about authenticity. And let me know, let me pose the question this way. Is integrating authenticity or how could we integrate authenticity in tourism education to sort of combat these types of things that happen organically is there a role for this authenticity and curating the authentic tourism professional aha yeah, i will start um <laughs> i want to alicia had mentioned in her opening about the multidisciplinary nature of tourism and being able to work across agencies work with different people um I think, you know, sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes there are experts. I am, you know, there are experts in different areas that I think bring an, that authenticity that you can incorporate into the education module. Bring them in either as, as lecturers or even train them in, in tourism. Um, so let me give an example. So Trinidad, we, Trinidad and Tobago, we are known for festivals, right? So we have, we have event planners. We have costume designers. We have musicians. You name it, we have it. If we want to market our, our festival tourism, we don't need to start with some, with a clean slate with somebody who knows nothing about event, about anything about festivals or events. We can tap into those people um, and work with them to develop their product, to sell, to market and, market and package. We can bring them into the, to the, unit, to the institute as, as, as lecturers to teach about this thing. We, could, we have to use this, the talent that we have, I think, the experts, the ones who are passionate about what they do, who are good about what they do, who want to be a part of the tourism product. Don't think that they are because nobody's doing anything, thinking too much about tourism and bring them in. And that's, that's, I think that is how we get the authenticity. Right. I like that. Anyone else um, wants to give a perspective before we open up? Yeah, years ago, um, when I was at the at THTI, there was a lecturer called Mr. James. Mr. Henry James, he's now deceased. And um, he came one day with a proposal that seemed simple, but um, it was really one of the more in, important initiatives that the Institute did at that point in time. He said, you know, Ms. Edwards, it's hard to teach people tourism if they have not been a tourist themselves. Mm. And so he started a, a, a thing where there was an annual trip by students of the Institute to another Caribbean destination or some other place. And the whole purpose of that trip was, I think, not just multicultural sensitivity training, which is the fancy word that we call it now, but it was an opportunity for you to see what other people were doing and the things that you were taking for granted, um, that you were taking for granted that was, that, that was special. So I remember on one trip, I don't know if anybody here, I saw Jack, um, Jackie on the call. On one trip, we went to St. Kitts, um, St. Wonderful. Kitts and Nevis, right? That's and my in, Right, and, and in Nevis, they had done so much work with the old sugar mills in terms of restoring them and using them as bed and breakfast and small restaurants, etc. And the conversations that happen afterwards in terms of Tobago having that same rich sugar industry from slavery history, having so many abandoned sugar mills and sugar plantations and estates, and not finding a way to monetize them as a tourism product, a tourism development product, that was not something that you could have taught in the classroom. And so we see a lot of cultural exchanges into our destinations. People are bringing people to learn a whole host of things in, in certain parts of Tobago. People are coming specifically to treat with dive and, and sustainable um, environmental things um, at Eric in Charlottesville. Students are coming in to study carnival, to study pan, to study wire bending, to study calypso. And so I think that field trips, well, they, I don't think they call them field trips now, but any sort of arrangements that get students outside of the classroom mm -hmm. and into actual authentic environments 
would not just teach them about the environment, but cause them to reflect about what is there around me in terms of the value that I'm not seeing. What diamond in the rough am I not seeing the potential for? How can we now not steal this idea, but massage this particular thing to add value where I'm from? And I think just, just keeping up with a subscription to a tourism magazine, making it your business as a tourism student to read and follow tourism news and publication, getting opportunities and joining, all of those things, talking to people, joining online communities, all of those things as a student are going to um, expose your mind, extend um, your, your boundaries, and really let you develop what that limitless capability to pivot and innovate, because a lot of, of things that are happening are things that can be replicated here. Um, a couple months ago, I was talking to somebody, I think from Azerbaijan, and they had something called a cheese store. Right? It was a cheese store. And all that was happening is that people were paying to go from one farm to the next, right? To look at people milk different kind of dairy. It was some was cow, some was elk, some was something else. But you were going to see people milk different kinds of, 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 of dairy and see what how they made cheeses and butters and whatever. And you were sampling it along with different kind of breads. And that was uh that was like, whoa, you know. Think about, I mean, Barbados is doing some culinary walks and all of that, but if we extend that same walk, does not have to be food, does not have to be cheese, but what do we have that we can create a walk? You know, so I think that that's important as well. Right. So three key elements, Kennedy, to look at with that is tourism and its role in obviously the economic, we've, we've, we've spoken right. about that. To really educate. So, for example, years ago, very similar to what Laura did in, in the Turks, here in Miami, they had a program called Miami Begins With Me. That actually wasn't targeted at the tourism worker. It was the ordinary taxi drivers, store clerks, and so on that were involved initially in that program. To, so they understand now how the tourism dollar benefits them. We also have to look at the important aspect of the environment because we depend so heavily on it so when we just throw garbage and stuff from the windows and all these little things that we do to 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 cause now a bigger burden on the, the public services now to keep the place clean where everybody can understand that this is part of my responsibility that i might not operate a tour company or a bed and breakfast or something but if i keep the environment the taxi driver going come to my business so we have to help them understand the economic chain um and the social aspect that we really have to get into that piece to, to recognize that or well, if we have in the crime situation you know tourists and especially with social media we've been talking about and all these um mm -hmm. content producers that are out there that we don't have any control over that we really have to now make a focused effort to, to really do some work on, on, the, on that side to make sure that um, we can really leverage and benefit from the full value of tourism. Okay, wonderful. Well, we're at that time where we want to invite the comments, questions, concerns from our live audience. Remember, we're discussing sustainability excellence, innovating education in hospitality and tourism for the next decade. I see that we do have one person with their hand raised. I am going to let you participate. Dow, can you open your microphone and pose your question? Did I pronounce that correctly? Dow Tran? Dow, are you hearing us? All right, while Dow gets the technical issues sorted out, let me jump to uh, Ornella. Ornella has a comment. Ornella? Good night. Um, my name is Ornella Charles Duncan. I'm a proud student of THDI Tobago. Um, I would say persons who decided to like, okay, before I knew about THGI and opportunities there are, which is a, is amazing with the opportunities that I have now known that they give to people 
right? When you decide to go and better your standard of living, just your mindset as a young person or as a young adult, right? Um, you will then change your, your outlook on life. You will then change the content that you share because I, I can say that I did real crap before and now that I am in this institution, I feel real important. I want to use a better word, but only understand what I'm saying. I feel proud. I feel a joy. I hear what I am a college student. I'm a person who I would I don't want to use the wrong terms, but as a young black quote unquote person, right, only seen men, right? As a young black quote unquote person, right, I could say here what I am. I'm now an example for young people. I am example for I am a mother of four. I'm now an example for my children. So that they can see here what even if you had a hiccup, I don't want to say a mistake. You had a hiccup before, you can still at 35, 36, go and better your standard of living, your mindset. It betters what you put out there because before I would have go and post something. I know I'm not a vulgar person because I'm a parent, but I'm a voiceless person. And now being in hotel school, being able to grasp this opportunity, it it kind of changed my outlook on my words that I put out there, on the way I dress, on the way I move, on the way I... Because before, I, I, I didn't have a, a better standard. Now that I have uplifted myself, I've told somebody the other day that my circle is different. My circle has improved. So... I no longer look back and say, nah, boy, let me think off. No, I, I am in a better mindset. Right? And you all said you all want ways to improve. What I was now talking about, right? Improve all of these things. We could go and, you know, when you go to school, um, they have home ec. I don't know if they're changing the, no, the name now. They have home ec. But I don't want to say it's bootleg, but it's bootleg. Right? They teach you how to make little pizzas. But if me as a student, I, I boast it and I have I have sent it in my group and people say, Oh, you can join hotel school. The, the vice principal say, Girl, you encouraged me. Yesterday she said that you encourage me. I feel like going up there and take a course. Because they see the change in me. We could go in the schools and talk and you know, explain to them here what we we was like this. We were like where we pants on the bottom, but now we pants on we waste because we are better in our mindset. And if we go in schools directly, you know, yes, they will have to us to hotel school. But if we apply ourselves, if we become the example that we want them to be the leaders that we want them to be, we go into the schools and we say, hey, what? Just so we have to us to go. Let me say we have an outing to go. The outing will go. And here what? We're taking a group of persons. Let me say my class have like 21 students. We bunch them up in fives. And we go into Mason School. We go into Harmons. We go into Goodwood. We go into Speyside. And we show them what we can do. We show them and we be the, the leaders because, for example, I was a, a normal person and I went white. And I I know shame, I was Miss Betty Crocker. I couldn't bake anything. I couldn't bake a cake from scratch. And I got the exposure, the experience. And then that made me want to go further. Tell my children, saying, Mommy, I want to be a chef now. I know I don't want to be a lawyer. I know I want to be a doctor. But I want to also want to be a chef because the same here what? There's a lot of things out there. I come and I tell them here what? For my internship, I want to go to Dubai, Dream Bay, or go home. Or I want to wow. go to, to France. Or I want to go to Texas. I don't want to go right here. They say, whoa, mommy. You know, um, you're really dreaming big. I say, yeah. Or oh, they had to cut down on one thing, extra snacks and things, because I don't save <laughs> Dubai money. Oh, they you thank you so much for that. That, that young so people can get from here, the, uh, the opportunities that young people can get from THTI is great, and we should share the message out there to the world. Right? Thank you so much for that contribution, Manila. Um, that's a live example of how tourism and hospitality education has really helped to recalibrate the trajectory or your trajectory and the impact that as a single student you have had on your community around you, those who surround you. Okay, uh, Dal, if you are still with us, we, we, we definitely would like to hear from you. I'm going to ask persons to keep their comments at least to 60 seconds because we want to get as many questions and comments in as possible. And let me also invite Claudia and Nashton to share. So, Dao, are you with us? 
If not, Claudia, we'd love to hear from you. Yes. Hi. Good night, everyone. Yes. Yeah, so um, I am just as excited as Ornella, but as you said, let me keep it short. Um, what should I say? My pause raised when I listened to Laura because I am in Trinidad and uh, I started last year to actually do you know, different um, trips with like Road Trip TTD National Trust, uh, Tree Circles Energy. And in doing one of the trips, uh, I ended up speaking to a tour guide and I ended up doing the tour guiding course offered by COS that I just completed it. Our lecturer actually got an award, uh, you know, um, for her work from the, well, you know, for Independence Republic the um, awards that they give out and uh, um, listening even to Alicia and uh, when I was going around in Trinidad I said it was so nice to see the amount of places that we have here that we could monetize for tourism a lot of things these derelicts you know and I like what uh, Laura was talking about with the course that, that she would have had to do in Turks and Caicos and really and truly we need to do that because people don't love our country we try to travel get foreign exchange to go everywhere else to see what we have right here you know so that is my contribution so I'm really grateful that you all are doing what you're doing and I really hope a lot more people and the government come on board to get us because I think we could spin money here with tourism and get people off of the streets to employ a lot of people. So that's my contribution. Thank you for those comments, Claudia. Let me now invite uh, Nashon, followed by Kathy, uh, to make their contribution. Nashon? Hi, good night. Um, so the conversation before I was hearing Laura talk about um, a lot of stuff right that was very um informative for me but my question is how do you go about branding your island like when we think of places like turks or saint bats you know we think of luxury there are facilities like nikki beach and a lot of members clubs right as somebody who travels a lot you know we have programs such as hired members marriott bond boy world of Hyatt, stuff like that right um and in trinidad yes we do utilize social media you know we have the hashtag visit trinidad visit tobago and you know it's pushed a lot but there is not um a unique value proposition there's not a brand attached it yes we have carnival at the beginning and the end of the year with trinidad and to be respectively we have jazz festival but those are like one-time things during the year how do we brand for like longevity Be before we answer that question let's take the the comment or question from kathy and then we'll come back to the panel kathy hi pleasant good night to everyone um what I would like to contribute is that I have been in the industry, the hotel industry since I left high school. And the last hotel that I would have worked, because I would have worked with people like Mr. Carlos Dillon since in Mount Irving, may God rest his soul. And the last hotel I worked would have been Magdalena. And you're actually seeing in Tobago, especially, customer service is dying. And this is because persons are not taking this whole idea of customer service seriously. Why is it we actually, okay, so for example, for me, I actually left the country, went to Curacao and actually see what it was like being on the opposite side. Hence the reason why I could afford to say customer service on our beautiful island in the hotel industry is dying. People need to actually step out of their comfort zone, go and further their studies to see what it is we are actually supposed to be doing to boost tourism on our island, right? So that is basically just my contribution. But as I said, it is dying. I have been in the hotel industry, as I said, since I left high school, and I only took a break because I just wanted a change. But honestly, I am ready to go back. I am ready. Thank you so much for that, Kathy. So over to our panelists, we have the question from uh, Hashton. How do we go about branding our destination? And of course, we have the comments in relation to customer service. Let me pose a question uh, as it relates to customer service. Is our hospitality and, educa uh, hospitality and tourism education system adequately helping students overcome the differences or understand the differences between service and servitude? That's just my take on the customer service comment. 
who's going to jump in first? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that one, um, Kennedy. I think by and large, yes, that once students come into formal institutions that they recognize that this is a serious profession and career. So, so that helps a lot. Um, one of the things that I would want to, in terms of looking at the theme or the topic for tonight, in, in terms of innovating education, then challenge the educational system now is we have um as new products come on stream the need for more talent more labor right so a lot of positions um not only on the island of tobago or across the caribbean region but we can also um, look now to see labor talent as an export product because if you look at the united states for example there's over a million open positions in hospitality and tourism cannot be filled so in the academy we have to get now a little bit more creative mm -hmm. in how we approach bringing people to the fold so we have people who may have and we talked about are we developing the leadership pipeline people who have been working in the industry can we now look at say taking a portfolio of the body of their work and using that to give them some type of academic credit to recognize what they're doing. Um, so we can bring them into the stream to, to further upskill them from an academic um, perspective. So they can, you know, if you, if, you, if you thought that you could only be a line worker or a line supervisor, you can start getting up now to be a, a, a middle manager or something. So we have to, at the academy level now, start looking at that. How can we get more talent into our institutions? All right, thank you, David. I just want to jump in here on a couple of things. Um, and I'm, I guess um, the history showing my age. Yeah, many, many decades ago, when Bonita Morgan was still at the CTO, one of the things that they were working on at that point in time was how do you create a continuing education credit system um, within the tourism sector? Um, but that project didn't get very far and Benita, um, when she died and things have moved on. But I think that there is the need for, for, for two things to happen. One, that the same way we have um, regional NVQs for a lot of other disciplines, that we need to come to a point, whether it's through the CTO or whether it's through some other entity, how do we create an arrangement for continuing education points in tourism to be awarded? Because a lot of our more experienced practitioners have not had the rigor of a program such as the ones that we um, now offer, but they do have a lot of knowledge that should be accredited and armed to them. The second thing that I think that we need to do is to find ways for training organizations to partner with other people in different other organizations. So for example, there may be an opportunity for THDI to partner with UE on specific things, whether it might be international relations courses or some cultural sensitivity training. There may be an opportunity for Roy Tech to partner with THDI to offer some media relations training for students who might be interested. And so maybe in the area where there may be an elective course, because most programs have like an elective, your elective does not have to be something within um, your, your school. It could be an accredited course from another organization where there is a memorandum of understanding. And what that will do is that it will help people to explore specific interests. People would develop a wider range of talent. And so when people graduate from those organizations, they now are richer. And the richer you are, as we're seeing with the comments that are coming, the more you can fertilize the environment in which you um, find yourself. Um, on the question of branding, branding a destination is a whole science. It is not something that any one entity can do. And it's something that a destination has to commit at the highest level to do because you have to start a conversation everywhere across your country about what do you want your country to be known for? What are you good at? What do you want people to think about when they are? And so that has a lot to do 
with what your strategic visioning is at a national level, what your tourism policy says at a national and, 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 and for us at a Tobago level, and also what are the things that you have a relative competitive advantage for, not just in terms of natural resources, but in terms of people resources, access mm -hmm. to capital, access to training and all of those things. And we are not always ready for that conversation. So sometimes somebody with a vision will start the process of branding, but then somebody else comes in who don't understand the process and we just dismantle. So in Tobago, a lot of conversation has happened around the change of the brand from clean, green, serene to Tobago beyond, right? That's a, con I mean, we have not been clean, green and serene for a long time, but the Tobago Beyond branding has not really caught on because we did not do the necessary, not just brand development work, but the brand integration work. And it's an ongoing process because mm -hmm. brands evolve. Crick started off and they, 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 they celebrated 100 years this year. Crick's, that's a, a cracker company in our country. And Crick's have only been able to celebrate 100 years and remain strong because Crick's has continued to play on emotions have, have continued not just to make take flour and water and salt and make this but they're making the same product but to find a way to become a part of the fabric of the society at every generation stage and to remain constant and for a lot of destinations we are not constant long enough at this brand development brand integration brand deepening and thing and so we start and we follow yeah I I just want to add to what Alicia said with respect to branding. It, she's right. It is it is constantly evolving and it is a science. Um, I think one of the things you need to understand is, as she said, your competitive advantage. What are the products you have to offer in your country? I'm trying to be go is a, a place that is rich with so many things. We could compete in culinary, um, ecotourism. Tobago has the beautiful seas. Um, we have history we have festivals you name it what are the products you have to offer and then who are the markets that are available to consume these products also what can your country accommodate because there are countries that do mass tourism and so they're known for that for Turks and Caicos for instance we cannot do mass tourism it's, a, it's, it's 40 islands and keys but it's a small country we don't have properties to accommodate eight million people like the Bahamas right so for our niche is luxury tourism it's a small niche very very targeted because that is what we could accommodate um and you find you will have the resorts and everything to that will that could cater to that niche so you have to understand all of those things and then you decide as, as Alicia said what is the focus what do you want your country to be known for um, again, I'm referencing to this because this, I'm actively here and this is what I do on a daily basis. Um, we are known as beautiful by nature because it truly is a beautiful, what, what Turks and Caicos has is nature. The, the, the water is the re most ridiculous shade of blue that you've ever seen. It's so gorgeous. So we are known for that, beautiful by nature. But as, as Lisa said, things evolve. So now, while beautiful by nature would have been the brand, the branding that was traditionally done for Turks and Caicos. Now, our focus is selling the destination as a multi-island destination because we have, it's 40 islands and keys, eight of which are inhabited. And the, the government decided that too much of the largest from tourism was coming to Providencialis, which is the commercial tourist hub. And the other islands weren't benefiting from tourism. So as a DMO, our mandate is to ensure that every single person in the Turks and Caicos islands benefit from tourism so now we our our branding is multi-island destination that is our branding that is what we are selling to the world and then it's a constant once you decide what your brand is going to be what your message is going to be it's constant selling that message it's your relationship with the media not just as whole at home but internationally it's the money you have to spend on advertiser let me tell you all it is not cheap <laughs> <laughs> These, these public, these luxury publications charge an arm and a leg, so you have to have the investment there. It, it's, it's your relationship with your travel advisors again, how you, how you educate them on the island, what each island has to sell, what each island is promising. We sell in barefoot luxury. So we have to show that in each island, this is what you're getting. 
We have to sell the accommodate properties, the accommodation. All of that is in keeping with the brand of us as a destination selling a luxury product, which is why the training the, with, to make sure everybody's knowledgeable about the island is so important because we have to have a minimum standard at least. So even the taxi drivers, they have to dress a certain way. Their cars have to be in a certain condition. You can't sell luxury and you're jumping in an old taxi by the airport. The taxis have to look a certain way. The properties are ridiculous, you know, because again, that is what we sell, luxury. So you have to determine at the time, and as Alicia said, from the governmental level, what do you want your country to be known for? And then make sure your messaging is in keeping with that, your visuals, the, the kind of conferences and showcases that you go to, because all of that helps to sell that brand. Right. Well, we have two more questions uh, from persons for the panelists, and I'm getting a distinct theme coming out in all of the answers. And that theme says that when it comes to hospitality and tourism education, practicality is king, right? So the education has to be relevant, it has to be responsive, it has to be aligned. So within that context, here is uh, here are the next two questions from uh, Adrian. When it comes to space tourism, so Adrian is thinking beyond the stratosphere. When it comes to space tourism, how would one go about applying to work for a space hotel? And what qualifications do you think would be needed? That's the first question. And then we have a question from Avalon Sandy. So specific to Tobago, so again, very contextualized. What can the THTI do to help start teaching tourism in primary school? Mm. Ay, ay, ay. Questions, questions. I, I like the spin <laughs> balls that are coming out this evening. Well, space tourism, obviously, right now, it's a lot of the private sector that's um, leading that charge. So it would be to get aligned with um, what some of those companies to see if you can get a foothold in the door. Um, obviously, that's probably going to be very competitive. But again, it's to do research on what the requirements are, who they're looking for, um, understanding what the, what the job op opportunities are are there, I had suspect that uh, probably a lot of the opportunities in space tourism itself would actually be here um, on ground. So it's just doing a little bit of research to see, um, you know, the pri those co two primary, primary pri private sector companies that are involved with, with that effort right now. The governmental stuff in terms of NASA is really, you have to be heavy into the science and, and, and all of that to be um, to even get into that program. So it's it's not that that still isn't so much on the hospitality business side, but on the research and the science side. But again, if you're looking at, at a, a suggestion there is to become entrepreneurial and what is it that we can replicate here mm -hmm. that simulates that? So maybe is a, a simulation experience that, that you can create people like that sort, sort of stuff. Now, now, I'm curious. I don't think I want to spend a few hundred thousand dollars to leave Earth to do the same thing up in space. I'm looking for somebody to bring something new and edgy to me that I can brag about to my friends and say, hey, you have not experienced the new frontier of tourism until you've done X, Y, Z in space, right? That's the kind of curious mind that I have. I but, see, but as you know, it's yeah, still in, it, it's er, early days yet, and it's still mm. evolving. So you know, the, somebody who comes up with a great idea mm -hmm. and make it um, a little bit more affordable will will we'll probably <laughs> <laughs> be at the forefront. I like that. I like that. Uh, any thoughts on um, the THTI's possible role in tourism education in primary school? Um, yeah, I I would want to take that one. I think that um, in Tobago right now. Uh, multidisciplinary committee has been put together to make the curriculum more Tobago centric and I know for sure that some part of the discussion about that curriculum has to do with uh, more tourism education within what is traditionally called um, social studies. Um, but for now I think that the institute is a perfect place for um, field trips a lot of, I don't know the extent to which they open their facilities and doors to, to, to primary school children, but I think that it's an excellent opportunity to start with simple field trips 
where students will go and see what is happening at the school, go to the kitchen, do whatever, see what's happening on the compound. And then there's also the opportunity for persons from the, the hotel school students, um, like Ornella, um, lecturers, other people in the industry, members of the board, to actually go to classrooms and share about tourism with um, students. But it's not just what schools and what THDI can do. I think a big responsibility for education, we don't like to talk about it, falls on parents. Parents have to parent better. Parents have to prepare um, children and young people for this world, this changing world that we're operating in. And so while THDI and other entities may do what they have to, the raw material that comes to you has to be a raw material that is better equipped for a different kind of world. And so I think that um, at a national level, we have to start holding parents accountable for not just feeding and clothing and giving children a place to sleep, but actually giving children experiences about the places that they live, the islands that they live, the things that are there, the opportunities that are available for children so that they can start thinking bigger um, beyond. So education becomes um, a more about possibilities than just about tests and grades. I want to make a suggestion that, you know, the, the, the um, Tobago Hospitality and Tourism Institute could probably work with THA, or maybe this is something that could be led by the THA and and teach the I work with them to establish tourism clubs in schools, um, in primary schools as well as the secondary schools. Um, and that they have them already, Laura. They okay, have them. right. Yeah. And but just on the level of the secondary schools, just on okay, secondary maybe, schools. Yeah. Right. So maybe something can start from primary school. So when they go into secondary school, they're already familiar, and then it could continue. Right. Because I that that um the youth the tourism youth congress that took place in um in. Came on when Tobago came second, I believe it was. Yes, she was really good. I was so impressed by the the level of debate and the way these these young people, you know, really put forward their ideas and they had some really good novel ideas. And so I think it would be a good graduation from primary into secondary. And then you have something to aspire to to becoming possibly becoming a Caribbean tourism ambassador and getting to go to all the conferences and travel and stuff. So Maybe something could you could initiate from primary school. Definitely. Okay, so we're winding down. I see we have four more, well, three more hands raised. I want to give Dal the opportunity to come back and to pose their comment or question. I'm hoping that you can hear us and uh, we can hear you now. So Dal, Juliana, and the last question will go to Ornella. So I'm letting all of you in. Dal, can you hear us? Uh, can you hear me is the question. Yes, loud and clear this time. Yes, Excellent. good. I, I actually left and then came back. And that's, you know, like, that's like shutting off the computer and making sure that it works. And then you just unplug everything. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so uh, thank you for thank you for letting me speak. Um, I am not from the island, although I would love to be from the island. Um, I have visited Tobago for over 25 years to scuba dive. My last visit that I was just at, it was actually not a vacation. It was what I called a work vacation um, because I, I have been doing a lot of research about Tobago and um, wanting to learn a little bit more about why there is, um, are you having a hard time hearing me? No, okay, loud and clear. Putting, okay, um, so I was uh, wondering why there's a problem with the education system in Tobago. And so when you were speaking, uh, Ms. Edwards, about the education, um, it is compulsory. I have a hard time saying that word. English is a second language for me. Um, it is not mandatory up until it's mandatory up until the age of 12. So grade five. And then you have to pass it. Please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. You have to pass your uh, your um, we call that assessments in order for you to move up and choose to either go to a vocational school or to go to a secondary school, high school, and then move on towards high school. Is that correct? More or less, yes. Okay, great. Um, so as a former educator in New York City, um, there was a program that I used um, and was written up in the New York Times about teaching kids. And this is what I think Tobago could really use and, and maybe a lot of the islands. Um, so it is a program where, like you said, Miss Edwards, where the parents have to be more engaged. Um, and it's called the 
uh, um, I can type this in so you guys can see it. It's called the Emilio Reggio uh, program um, methodology. It's based out of Italy. They um, and this is a program where to Tobagonians and the school system can integrate the what you're learning in the primary school um, in with agriculture, in with tourism, and in with um, your field trips. Your field trips should be very geared towards the students understanding, your citizens understanding what the island provides for you, and then how you can transfer that to what it can provide for the tourists that are coming. Um, and I feel that there's a large gap between having the uh, education stop at grade 12 and you guys are asking for talented uh, human resources capital, but you don't, but it's not mandatory for you to continue on uh, to school after grade five if you don't pass. It, it, is that correct? Well, things have changed a little bit in that it's only if you get on the 30% that you don't go on to secondary school. But I'm smiling as you're speaking because um, as somebody who has been involved in education for a long time, we've had a lot of conversations about how education has to evolve um, at all levels. And I think what is happening is that policy is lagging behind intention because they did you have to you have to take a quantum leap swallow and then make a whole 180 turn in order for things to be different and in all part of the world everything is incremental people are tied to certain things even the introduction of technology in schools we started it aggressively and then we've pulled back and we have all of these things teachers unions um pay, salary, parental challenges, a whole host of things coming in. And so it is going to take quite a bit for our system to kind of evolve and to be as integrated and as, as practically relevant and culturally relevant as we want it to be. But I think that you're making an excellent point. And I want to um, thank you for coming to Tobago for as long as some of our students online have been. I know that you're coming back because it's probably the most beautiful place in the world. And I hope that the next time you come, that you be, yes, it, yes, it is. But we're not going to tell David and Laura and Kennedy anything about that. They're going to get jealous. <laughs> so thank you so much for the comment. And thank you so much for visiting our island and being interested in general about what goes on uh, in Tobago. Thank you so much. Yeah. Greatly appreciate it. Juliana? Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Go right ahead, Juliana. Yes. Um, when I hear the word Tobago, something happens inside of me. I, I, when I'm in Tobago and I travel and I speak and people ask me where you're from, don't ask me that question. I am from Trinidad and Tobago. I spend most of my time in Tobago. I'm getting very emotional when I think about Tobago. I travel in the bus and I watch in the, the coastline from Scarborough to Goodwood. And I said, do these people know what they have? Do they appreciate what they have? It's always a joy. This is not even what I wrote down to say. <laughs> it's always a joy to travel. Um, we have to be on the ground with the people more to actually see what's going on and to know the needs there is. A simple thing too, as the um, jet ski operators, it hurt my heart when I hear these guys who fell, fall, fell off in the last two years, two of them. It should be mandatory that they wear the um, life jacket. It should be mandatory that they wear the life jackets. And I thought of some other training for them sometime and it slipped my mind. I want to know if we, if there is a site that one thinks that should be a tourist attraction, how do we go about that? And I don't want to let the cat out the bag, but I'll do it anyway. There is a tree in Goldsboro. Alicia, you know what tree I'm speaking about? Mm -hmm. We know there are yes, plenty of people. I, I, think, I think so. I think so. Yeah. But you go ahead so, and make your point. Yes. I, I visit that tree, and how come nobody has seen it fit since 1940 when the Swiss 
family Robinson um, film was was made there, and nobody took it, nobody put a notice, um, put a white picket fence below our tree house to say that this was a tree that was used in that film to part of that Swiss family Robinson. You know, these things I see it and I see, but we have to be on the ground more for better tourism in Tobago. It is a beautiful island. Let us just go forward and help and make it better. Thank you. I enjoy what I'm what, what I'm hearing here tonight. Thank you a lot for the contributions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliana. And I think Ornella, you are the last to the batting. <laughs> Good night, everyone. I may ask or have a lot of contributions that my brain goes like that. Now, we say that we make food beautiful to feed person's eyes, right? Because that's the way you, you make people want something. And beauty is a part of tourism. It's just that we don't push on it. When tourists come to Trinidad and Tobago, we can open an industry now where when they come, they can get beautified. Other than food, beauty is a main part of women's lifestyle. And if we can incorporate food and beauty, I'm not saying you want to be beautiful and go in the kitchen, but persons should come and they can get treatments at different hotels. Because when you go to a hotel, you go to the spa, and sometimes the spa service isn't, isn't up to par. But if you're an opener institute, right to teach persons to better deal with visitors you, you don't think that you would get a a bigger flow in of persons that's my contribution beauty is also a part of tourism and we need to capture it and shine a little light on it thank and it's you opportunities so for persons to better their standard of living as well thank you and good night thank you so much for that contribution on nella uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are just about ready to close things out. We've been having a, a wonderful discussion talking about education, specifically our topic, sustainability excellence, innovating education in hospitality and tourism for the next decade. I want to give each of the panelists 30 seconds just to say that final thing that's on your chest, that's on your heart, a, a, a closing salvo, if you will. Talk to us. Who wants to start off? I will start. Um, I just want to thank you all for this amazing discussion. I feel like we could go till 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> I want to applaud you all for this initiative, the Tobago Institute, the Tobago Hospitality and Tourism Institute for this initiative. And I just want to say, I know when the Trinidad um, Hotel School closed down, it really sent a ripple throughout the Caribbean. A lot of people, a lot of hoteliers sent a lot of their staff to Trinidad to train. And I feel like um, you all are poised to, to fill that void and to become a beacon for the entire Caribbean, not just Tobago, to become that place for the entire Caribbean. I feel like that local, the Caribbean training is very important because while you can learn a lot of these things everywhere in other places, I feel like culturally there are some things that we bring to the table as Caribbean people that a Caribbean training will make sure we keep our Caribbean-ness to the way we approach things. So I just want to applaud you all for this initiative and happy anniversary. I, I, I want to close by saying that um, it's wonderful that the hotel school is celebrating 27 years. And I think that this is an excellent way to remind students that tourism is still alive and well um, in Tobago and that tourism can grow. I know that where there is a new airport terminal being built in Tobago and a whole lot of infrastructure developments that are either happening or in train. But I think that from where you sit as students um, of the hotel school, it's important for you to stay the course to complete your studies and not just to complete your studies and see this as a part-time thing, but to actually share not just your knowledge, but share what you've learned about the destination that is Tobago. Continue to move around the destination and see it with different eyes. At every point in time, wherever you connect or where you find people, speak positively about Tobago. 
And you don't have to be a paid ambassador to do that. I love to be there. I think it's the most beautiful place in the world. And whether and it doesn't matter that I don't have a formal position in tourism, I see myself as somebody who can influence people to come to the destination, to be a part of the experiences in the destination. And so I experience my life here as a tourism. I share, I post in a particular way. And so as you know more and understand how nuanced and how far reaching some of the things that you do in your everyday life are, as you can complete this course, I trust that you will operate in a way that will make you be an informal tourism ambassador. It has been a pleasure connecting with you. I love talking about education and Tobago and all of those things. And so I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. And I trust that the celebrations um, that maybe when, when THDI gets to 50 years, I may still be around to talk about what was happening in year seven and year 27 and all of that. So thank you so much, everybody, for, for bearing with me. So to, to really um, wrap this up, I, I'd say um, from my side, first, congratulations to THDI for putting, putting on this panel. So we'll talk about innovation in education. This is innovation in, in education being applied, real life, right? So we've used the modern technology. And I think we, we had um, connections, at least from the, the US mainland, from Tobago itself, probably from Trinidad, from Turks, obviously. So this was a global audience listening to this. So this is a bold endeavor in terms of where we need to move the education, because this is education itself. This is a great educational session. And hopefully now, as we have more and more of these conversations, that people start understanding the importance of tourism, the far reaching effect of tourism, so they can demand more of the policymakers. If that's what education is, not only what we teach in the classroom, it's this kind of forum where people get informed about the social aspect of it. So they can demand more from their representatives. They can speak from a more informed position because they understand the business and the dynamics of tourism a little better. So again, innovative education on display. I was happy to be a part of this and I look forward to continuing the dialogue with you all. And I really wanna say from Laura's perspective that it is important that you have to keep the Caribbean connection because that cultural perspective is so important and that cultural nuance. You can't get that in North America. You can't get that in Europe. You can't get that in China. So we have to really make sure that this educational um, framework is, is really developed and, and evolves as time moves on. Thank you so much for being a part, for allowing me to be a part of this. And congratulations again to THTI on 27 years. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. I love those those comments. And just, just allow me a minute or so to share some of the key takeaways. I mean, we've discussed so much this evening. We've looked at, you know, the post-COVID traveler and the implications for tourism education. We've talked a bit about education for survival. We, we brought the conversation home to this the whole idea of authenticity and curating these authentic tourism and hospitality professionals. And of course, we're doing all of this in the context of human resource development. So some of the key things that jumped out at me this evening from our discussion, early on in the bowling, think beyond the mainstream. Tourism education must go beyond those traditional uh, employment opportunities where we think, okay, this is a hotel worker and this is somebody who works for government. But tourism, it's multifaceted nature. It spans so much of the economy that we really have to pay more attention to ensuring that everyone understands the role that they play in helping to create, to craft, to nurture that tourism product. Uh, secondly, we can't sell what we don't know. I think this was very evident in the discussion this evening. We have to know our country. We have to know our destination. We have to know where are the best places to eat local food? What are the best beaches to go to if you want to be undisturbed and have that you know, authentic local visitor experience? Connect with industry to make sure that the education is practical. I think that was one of the things that we drove home 
quite a bit this evening, the practicalness needed in the hospitality and tourism education, making sure that we create professionals who are fit for purpose, as it were, to take the Caribbean tourism industry to bigger and better places. Uh, tourism as a business. Uh, this is one of the themes that really stuck with me. We need to be able to unpack the tourism industry. It's triple bottom line, people, profit, planet. So looking at the social, economic, the environmental, we need to help the persons who are involved and even those who don't think they're involved to see the interconnectedness of this great big business wheel that is tourism. Uh, cultivate our homegrown talent. There's lots of opportunity in tourism and hospitality education to ensure that we leverage the expertise, the homegrown authentic expertise that we have, bring it into the classroom and make the industry and the education a lot more practical. Uh, experience is key. This is one of the, the, the themes that again came out very, very strongly this evening. Um, some of the final thoughts, okay, branding takes a village, right? It is a multifaceted coordination of many different stakeholders, players, interests. We need to look at, you know, what do we have on offer? Who are our consumers? What can the country accommodate? And what do we want to be known for? So these are some of the essential elements of branding that came out in the discussion. And of course, finally, there are opportunities for us to fill the gaps. I think the statement was, policy is lagging behind intention. And so as tourism educators, whether um, the academic education, the practical education, we have an opportunity to recognize those gaps and to quickly bridge those gaps in a way that doesn't require a full course reevaluation or reapproval. Uh, or reapproval, but rather the extension of the information, the relevance of the examples, the locality of the examples, making sure that Caribbean destinations are featured in best practice works and so on. These are some of the creative opportunities that we have. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to express simply a thanks to the Tobago Hospitality and Tourism Institute for organizing this session. You have been wonderful guests. I hope that I, I, I you know, I, I made the session enjoyable and light. And thank you for, for having us. We really enjoyed it. Do have a wonderful evening and happy World Tourism Day once again. Okay. Bye.